This is a reading of Shipwreck at the Bottom of the Worlds by Jennifer Armstrong. And the chapter's called The Face of the Deep is Frozen. The Arctic contains 90% of the world's snow and ice, and there are more than 80 kinds of it. There's brash ice, pancake ice, bullet ice, green ice, frazzle, nillas, brescia, shrugga, slush ice, rotten ice, pressure ice, grease ice, ice dust, shore fast ice, ice flowers, ice haycocks, ice saddles, flow, flows, calf bergs, growlers, and sastrugai, to name just a few. And when it comes to icebergs, there are whole family trees to study. In the family of tabular bergs, there are domed, horizontal, blocky, tilted, and, e and uneven bergs. In the tribe of rounded bergs, there are sub-rounded, well-rounded, and rounded bergs. And when it comes to irregular bergs, there are tabular remnants, pinnacled, pyramidal, dry dock, castellate, jagged, slab, and roof bergs. Much of the ice on the continent of the Antarctic is actually a form of consolidation of snow called fern. As snow accumulates, it begins to compact, forcing out the air between the snowflakes. Eventually, all the air is squeezed out and the snow is a dense, heavy ice. This compression also makes much of the ice blue. These masses of ice form glaciers that reach the edge of the continent, where every year 5,000 to 10,000 icebergs calve or break off from the ice sheets into the surrounding ocean. Many icebergs are so large that they create their own weather systems. The largest iceberg ever recorded was one of the size of Belgium, close to 12,000 square miles spotted in 1956. And the most northerly iceberg reached 26 degrees south latitude in the Atlantic in the Tropic of Capricorn. As the icebergs drift, the seawater erodes them from below until the berg abruptly topples over and continues its journey upside down. The erosion continues until the berg flips around again and then again, and eventually it is eroded and melted away. As the icebergs calve from the glaciers on the continent, they bring with them mineral deposits scraped up from the ground and release these nutrients into the water. As they melt, the bergs also release atmospheric nutrients that have been trapped in the ice for centuries. It is this steady deposit of nutrients from icebergs that make the waters of the Southern Ocean so rich and full of life. And this is a picture of Frank Wilde as he surveys the wreckage of endurance. Of course, the ocean around the continent also turns into ice. Salt water freezes at a lower temperature than fresh water, around 27 degrees Fahrenheit, depending on the concentration of salt and other minerals. As the water on the surface cools, it begins to condense and individual ice crystals act as seeds causing the water to congeal around them, squeezing the salt out into the water below. On the surface, the water seems to stiffen and turn greasy. A layer of thick, flexible ice is called nilas. If the nilas is disturbed by winds, the ice forms rounded disks called pancakes, which look something like white lily pads with their edges turned up. As the air temperature drops and the water continues to freeze, the pancakes mass together and harden into a single sheet or ice field because the water forces salt as it forces out salt as it freezes, the water below the ice field is saturated with salt and minerals and the ice itself is clean enough to melt 
into drinking water. The process of turning seawater into drinking water is important. It means that a shipwreck on a frozen sea does not necessarily mean certain death. When the exhausted crew of endurance gave up the battle against the pressure and abandoned the ship, the ice fields around her was not the site to inspire confidence. The ship itself was a mess of, snag, of snapped rigging and broken spars. Beside her on the ice was dump camp, a junk pile of most of the stores and equipment the men had. The dogs milled around, straining at their tethers, snapping and snarling at one another. The crew staggered like dead men, utterly beaten from their labors, trying to pitch tents so that they could crawl into deep into sleep. There were only 18 sleeping bags originally meant for the overland journey and the men drew straws to see who would get them. The rest of the men had to make do with wool blankets. Tom Crean was suffering from snow blindness, a temporary condition that often affects polar travelers when they are exposed to the glare of sunlight on snow. He had to be helped into a tent. That night, the ice beneath the tents quivered as whales rubbed up against it from below. Though we have been compelled to abandon ship, which is crushed beyond all hope of ever being righted, we are alive and well, and we have stores and equipment for the task that lies before us. The task is to reach land with all the members of the expedition, Shackleton wrote in his diary the next morning. There were precious few options available to the boss. Already the ship had drifted a thousand miles north and west with pack ice. The tip of South America was more than 2,000 miles away and there was no way of reaching it on foot. They had ample food, guns, matches, and dogs. But after all, they were in the Arctic, not Hyde Park in London. The circumstances were dire to say the least. After a quiet conference with Wilde, Shackleton announced his plan to the crew. They would march across the frozen sea with two of the three lifeboats to Paulette Island, 346 miles to the Northwest. To the best of Shackleton's knowledge, there was a cache of stores in a hut on Paulette Island from a 1902 Swedish expedition. What they would do once they reached that destination was not specified. It was enough to have a goal. He would plan the next step when they got there. But 346 miles is more than the distance between Boston and New York City, almost as far as Los Angeles to San Francisco, about the entire width of Iowa. They would have to walk the whole way, hauling their gear and the two boats. The men knew that they were doomed without their boats. Eventually they would reach open water. They would need the boats, no matter how burdensome they were to drag over the ice. Shackleton gave the men a couple days rest. October 30th was the appointed day of departure. In the meantime, there was much to get ready. Mrs. Chippy, the carpenter's cat had to be shot because without protection of the ship, the dogs would have eaten him. The youngest of the puppies who were too small to be pulled with the team would also have to be killed. While Mrs. While, while McNish and McLeod began fitting the lifeboats onto sledges, the rest of the crew began sorting their equipment. The men were given a two pound limit on personal gear, which allowed them only to keep items that were essential for survival. Although the boss did allow them to keep their diaries and their tobacco and the doctors were allowed their medical supplies. In a dramatic gesture, Shackleton took his gold cigarette case and handful of gold coins from his pocket and dropped them on the snow. Gold was useless for the task ahead. He then opened the Bible and scripted to him by Queen Alexandra and ripped out a page from the book of Job. 
out of whose womb came the ice and the hoary frost of heaven, who hath gendered it? The waters are hid as with a stone and the face of the deep is frozen. He folded the page into a pocket and dropped the heavy Bible on the cigarette case and the gold coins, showing the crew route they must take. If they want to sur survive, they must travel light, harden their hearts against sentimental keepsakes and trust that they could make do with bare bones of equipment. Shackleton, the improviser, believed that it was foolish to burden themselves with equipment for every possible emergency. As the days wore on, the pile of discards grew, extra clothes, books, scientific instruments and specimens, chess sets, flags, lanterns, tools, sewing kits, lucky talismans, razors, barometers, combs, scissors, playing cards, dishes, silverware, photographs. Each man added to the heap. Some of the men saved leather suitcases to use for boot repairs later on. Hussey kept his toothbrush and Shackleton ordered him to keep the banjo because they would need the comfort of music in the hard months ahead. Each man, man kept a spoon and a knife. <clears throat> the journey was ready to begin at 2 p.m. on October 30th under heavy gray skies. It had already snowed on and off during the day and it threatened to continue. That didn't pose much of a problem, but the road ahead did. If they only had to trek across 346 miles of flat ice field, the journey would have been bearable. But stretching ahead of them into the white horizon was a scene of utter devastation and chaos. It was as if a giant hand had smashed down onto the frozen face of the deep and broken into a million shards. Jagged flows tilted up at all angles. Pressure ridges reared up like wrinkles in a huge white blanket. If the sea had been frozen at the height of a tempest and every storm-tossed wave locked into place, the scene could not have been more jumbled and uneven. There were 346 miles of that to cross, assuming the drift of the pack didn't change course and carry them helplessly in another direction. This is a picture as the drew, the crew drags the James Kyrod fitted with sled runners over the ice to the next camp. Even on smooth ice, this was a difficult task. Once the ice became broken and jumbled, it became impossible. On the lead sled went Shackleton, Wordy, Hussey, and Hudson looking for the best route among the pressure ridges and tumbled ice flows. They were equipped with shovels, picks, and axes to chop a path through the chaos of ice. Behind them came the other dog teams pulling sleds that were each loaded with 900 pounds of stores and gear. Bringing up the rear was the remainder of the crew pulling the boats on sledge runners loaded with food and equipment. The boats weighed in at more than a ton apiece. 15 men in harnesses dragged one boat at a time across the wet snow and over the ice, stopping every quarter mile to rest before going back to haul the second boat forward. Shackleton was in constant anxiety over continuing pressure in the ice. If a crack opened up between one team and another, the result could be disastrous. So he kept the men and sleds and boats close together, relaying, relaying forward one agonizing quarter mile at a time. Frequently, one of the dog teams had to be unharnessed from its sled and then hitched to a lifeboat to help the man drag it over the hummock or ridge. After two hours of backbreaking labor, hauling the boats through wet, heavy snow, detouring around piles of broken flow, they were only one mile from endurance. Soaked and numb with fatigue, the men swallowed a hasty dinner and fell into their tents. It began to snow during the night. 
When the men resumed their burdens the next day, they had a new layer of heavy wet sludge to trudge through and more wet snow falling steadily. After another three hours and only an additional three quarters of a mile, the boss called to halt. He and Worsley were worried about damaging the boats as they knocked their way across the ice. They were getting nowhere. At the moment, they were on a very large level flow, more than a half a mile in diameter. There wasn't another good solid flat flow in sight, and Shackleton felt they could not do better for a camping place. The men pitched their tents on the wet snow and crawled into their sleeping bags. Shackleton anxiously scouted ahead and found it impossible to advance. The next morning, he announced that they would stay where they were and let the drifting ice pack carry them northward to a better position to make for Paulette Island. There was no alternative. Shackleton told Green to start adding large chunks of blubber to the food, crew's food. The thick seal fat that kept the animals warm would provide valuable calories in the men's diet and keep them from freezing. It was time to get used to it.